Hello, everybody. Back uh, from a very grey UK where we're going through Blue Mon- Blue Monday, that time of the year in January. Hi, Henry. Hey, Nina. Yeah, it is a bit of a grey day, but um, hopefully some <laughs> exciting AI news will will lift our spirits. Um, oh, always. Yeah. It never stops, right? <laughs> no, okay. it never does. Um, what have you got for me, Nina? Okay, so the story that I want to talk about first, because it's been the big story of the week, the one that everyone's talking about, has to do with basically some of the things that we predicted would happen in 2023, that the big kind of tech players would increasingly start to make plays in this space. And the big tech player that we're talking about today is Microsoft. I actually saw somebody refer to Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella as the Michael Jordan of AI on a LinkedIn post recently. And this has to do with the fact that they are making pretty bold moves in the space. Um, And they're being super aggressive, of course, on OpenAI. So they had that um, $1 billion investment in OpenAI from 2019, which is looking to be a pretty darn good investment. Uh, Also, given the fact that under that um, deal in 2019, they became the exclusive provider of Azure to... um, to open AI, so I'm sure they've recouped quite a bit of that money already. But of course, now we've been hearing about these secret funding talks for open AI. We heard that open AI would have this valuation of $29 billion if these uh, funding talks conclude. And we now know Microsoft is in the mix and they want to invest $10 billion into open AI. Under the terms of the deal, they would get 75% of OpenAI's profits until they recoup their investment. And then they would retain a 49% stake in OpenAI. What do you Mm -hmm. think about this all? It's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, 10 billion, even for Microsoft is is quite a lot of money. (laughs) And um, it's a real, it's a real shift. Again, we were speaking about this, I think last week from OpenAI's kind of perhaps initial uh, initial framing sort of pitch of themselves as this NGO, you know, now, now, now really seemingly getting in with the corporate corporate big boys, so to speak. Um, it's an interesting one as well to think about in terms of, is this closer to a merger in some respects than it is an acquisition <laughs> based on the sort of structure of profit sharing and then the stake retention? I mean, obviously Microsoft, much bigger company, you know, fingers in lots of different pies, but... Um, it'll be interesting to see how this will influence the direction of OpenAI's product development and integration in Microsoft tools. Um, it sounds like a, a like a, you know a very strong partnership, if not a kind of merger style. A partnership, situation. or you know, Microsoft is straight up owning OpenAI. I mean, I, we're mm. talking about crazy money here, right? The twenty-nine mm. billion dollar valuation, the ten billion dollar investment, but I mean, as I've commented in the past, you know, that although that valuation seems insane, if you think about kind of the foundational architecture, these foundational models, which I believe are going to completely change like the digital ecosystem Mm. as well as society and civilization itself, is OpenAI giving too much to Microsoft for too little, if you think about it in that view? So I I guess there are probably some good reasons why they are strongly considering this right um obviously we don't know their underlying financials what their burn rate is on on talent on compute um you know the the space is hotting up quite fast right there's a lot of people now pouring a lot of money into this both in established companies and also in some of the more kind of piffy little startups which are growing very fast so i imagine they are seeing the space heating up and maybe they have some heat of their own under their under their feet from from their own financials. So maybe this is a way for them to really sort of secure their lead, partner with one of the biggest companies in the world, and um, you know remove some of that uncertainty in a sense. I guess is maybe some of the rationale. But I would agree, it does seem like you know they are going to be entirely at Microsoft's mercy if they if they do take this 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 funding. Um, and given the way the space is going and, you know, the hype and the amount of money getting poured in, you know, who knows how much that stake could be worth in, say, five years time um, and whether that 10 billion could be a lot more 
you know, in, in that time period? Uh, I, I think it will be. Um, mm. So some of the predictions we made for 2023 are already coming true, right? Like we yeah, said, the yeah. big players are going to make plays in the space. It's already started. Microsoft seems to uh, be like straight off the bat on that. We said that billion dollars of investment money are going to pour in. That's already happening. Um, but here's a really interesting take. When you look at the big players, um, I'm just looking at a tweet from Ben Tussle. He actually wrote, he, mm. he has this newsletter called Ben's Byte, which is like a daily kind of uh, AI kind of summary newsletter. It's really good. And he tweeted uh, that the real AI winner is Microsoft. Billion dollars in open AI in 2019. It owns GitHub, which released Copilot. Um, Dolly powers Bing Image Creator. Volley, which produces an AI voice, can do so in three seconds of app, but we haven't even mentioned that yet. That's one of Microsoft's uh, voice synthesis models, which can recreate voice from just three seconds of training data. It's got GPT in Word, PowerPoint, Outlook, GPT powered Bing, and now potentially 49% stake in open air for $10 billion. Do you agree? Yeah, is, is Microsoft I, killing it? I think, Nina, we should have predicted the unfathomable a couple of years ago, which was that Bing might actually become relevant <laughs> again. Um, yeah. I, mean, I never but, even used it. Oh, I was going to say, I, I, what I don't is think. Bing? I, yeah, it's just like. <laughs> Chandler Bing from Friends. That was my only reference. <laughs> no, I think I think Bing is mostly used to search for Google's URL, um, <laughs> but maybe that will change. But yeah, look, I mean, I, I think you know they have made some incredibly shrewd and astute investments, both in terms of R and D on their own products, um, in companies that are the key infrastructure in this space, as you said, for the open source communities. GitHub is the place, right? Yeah. Um, and with OpenAI, you know, the tools that they're developing, obviously ChatGPT and Dali too are the big ones that everyone's talking about, but they're also doing stuff around, you know, um, coding and code development or co-programming um, and also things like music synthesis as well. Um, so to me, Microsoft who perhaps to some were seen as maybe lagging behind a little bit in terms of kind of cutting edge research before have actually seemingly played their cards incredibly well. And if they do secure, well, if they do provide this $10 billion of funding to OpenAI, um, I think, you know, they will have really laid down a marker of intent that probably, again, puts the heat under the Metas and the Googles and the other big companies, Amazon as well, right, in terms of how Amazon, do they stay relevant Apple. and competitive mm -hmm. and Apple, of course. Yeah, exactly. So interesting to see mm. what, what's going to happen. But like one final point on this. I mean, do you have any thoughts on apparently under... The, this potential funding agreement, the nonprofit OpenAI, the reason why OpenAI was actually funded to create AI that would benefit humanity as a whole would only retain a 2% stake in like OpenAI now, the for-profit venture. Mm. Um, how do you think about like their original fund, like their vision, their mission? And, you know, now obviously this is going to have to become a multi-billion dollar enterprise. Do you think that that's incompatible? It's a tough question. I think it's, it's clear, right, that the initial vision and way that the uh, the organization was founded has, has changed. And that's in some respects kind of inevitable when you're talking about developing the technologies that they are with the amount of money that's involved and also the amount of money that's needed to do that and stay on the cutting edge. And they've always been a company that has been trying to, um, you know, get there before others because they have a strong belief that they can do it better and more responsibly than others, right? Um, and I think they have shown a real care and attention to how these models are released and, you know, their policy team do some incredible work around safety and, you know, you can see that in the way they've done prompt restrictions and things like this. Um, but I think the core kind of message of this nonprofit being the guiding force does seem to feel, at least to me, a little bit like an afterthought in the actual greater machinations of what's going on. Um, I don't know if you agree or if, um, if you're more idealistic or more pessimistic about it, but um, yeah, to me, it certainly feels like it's losing its influence. I agree wholeheartedly. And um, so I have two points to make to that. The first is that when the market was less saturated in the sense that their dominance was really secured, nobody else was kind of building these foundational models. 
um, they had enough space to kind of step back and be like, look, we're, we're just doing like an ethical release. We're going to do a slow release. We're not going to leave leave it open to everyone and then all of a sudden a watershed moment like the open release of stable diffusion happens and look how quickly since then in a matter of months open ai has not only opened up its models for anyone to use opened up apis but it's like seriously going down this uh route with investors right where we're going to build now a for-profit multi-million dollar business and the second broader point which is so relevant to me in the context of this debate is that i think as generative AI becomes more mainstream and it is going to invoke fear and awe, I think there's going to be a lot of public debate around the issues like, oh, is AI going to automate me? What does this mean for my job? But I think there's actually a more important macro consideration, and that is who controls these models? Because whoever controls the systems and the models are obviously going to accrue an enormous amount, not only of wealth, but influence in shaping society itself. I mean, probably more influence than uh, is held right now by a government, which has been like this successive trend with these exponential technologies where all of a sudden you have these players like the big tech companies who mm. are not accountable to an electorate who are not obviously democratic le elected. They're a private enterprise who accrue even more power than a democratically elected government. So those trends, I think how these systems have the potential to put so much power into the hands of one player or a couple of players, I think is going to be so foundational in the next few years. Couldn't agree more. I, I think, you know, that's very much in your geopolitics and the kind <laughs> of, you know, neoliberal tech, tech company sort of, um, remit but yeah absolutely it's uh it's it's it has the potential to fundamentally change the balance of of power and control of of, of you know yeah foundational technologies and infrastructure and if we thought things like google search internet providers um you know social media have overstated power i agree that this could be an, an F even further step the next step right yeah well yeah. on that on that we'll happy see. note yeah <laughs> What, what so, you got, Henry? So I read a really interesting article this week um, by an, a, a freelance journalist, uh, Chris Stokel. Um, and it was a really interesting piece about how um, AI, generative AI models, particularly in the tech space, could hit what they call a data ceiling um, around 2026, because there's just not enough quality data to be ingested to keep improving these models. So I'm sure you've seen with a lot of these buzzy posts um, with the kind of GPT, chat GPT sort of uh, fetishizers, I should almost say, about how much better GPT-4 um, mm -hmm. is gonna be than GPT-3. Mm -hmm. I think something like a trillion parameters, um, you know, just an, an obscenely large amount of data, even compared to chat GPT, which um, GPT-3, I should say, sorry which was a market improvement and increase in training data on GPT-2. Um, and so I thought this was a really interesting idea or this an, idea, an interesting problem that generative AI and the companies and institutions developing it may face, which is, well, we have literally scraped everything that there is when it comes mm -hmm. to text-based data um, which is already a legally ambiguous area, right, as to how data is collected. But when you get to a point where there's, you know, the data reservoir is dry, so to speak, what do you do to continue improving models? Does it just become a mm -hmm. process of refining and cleaning data? Or does it become a process of having to create new data in a very expensive, time-consuming way? Or is there the really interesting avenue, which we've spoken about um, before Nina of synthetically generating new training data. Um, and this is a this is an idea which has been deployed, I believe, in the healthcare system already on, for example, biomedical imaging to help train uh, systems to recognize things like abnormal growths, tumors, things like this, um, and is kind of being tipped as a potential solution, a, a get out of jail free card for a problem of data essentially running out. Um, obviously has its own caveats around, you know, well, what kind of quality is that data going to be? How are you going to be able to create novel data out of data trained on existing data? <laughs> um, but I, a really, really interesting problem or challenge for companies 
when you're trying to build better and better models and the com competition is heating up. So, I mean, w w specifically on GPT-3, which I believe ChatGPT is based on GPT-3, it'll be interesting to see when GPT-4 comes out. Like you said, it's been exalted in uh, the, the commentariat as being, you know, this omnipotent. But, I mean, GPT-3 presumably is already pretty much trained on all text that's available or a huge swathe of it? I imagine a huge swathe of it, yes. But, it, but it, you know, if they are creating a data set, which is an order of, you know, orders of magnitude bigger for GPT-4, mm -hmm. again, I think mm -hmm. I think it was a trillion parameters. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but, I think you know, you're right. Yeah. yeah um, you know, that is, that that's data that they won't have, I, I can't imagine they have created that data themselves, um, you know, that will have been probably further scraping or finding new corpuses of text that they can draw from. Um, perhaps they've gone for some sources such as digitized catalogs of, of work from libraries or things like this, perhaps, as opposed to just scraping Wikipedia. I'm sure we'll, we'll find out soon enough how they've sourced it when it comes out. Um, and have you heard anything in terms of like what what will be better or is this still like entirely speculation at this point? <laughs> Well, so I guess it, it's difficult. I mean, there's a lot of speculation and I don't want to add to, um, you know, unfounded speculation in this regard. Um, I guess, you know, the interesting thing with chat GPT is that it wasn't a huge improvement on GPT-3. What it was improving was the way that we interface with it and yeah. the way that it was essentially framed as this kind of conversational chatbot, right? As again, as we talked about before, kind of like your your personal Jeeves um, or your own kind of digital Aristotle that can kind of teach you and, and seemingly engage with you in a critical way, even if that engagement is basically hollow and overconfident nonsense. Um, whereas I think GPT-4, if it is turning on this much more data, chances are maybe some of that overconfidence on hollow you know, things be. will be trained out. Mm -hmm. um, it might be able to provide data on things which are more contemporary. Again, uh, GPT-3 uh, or chat GPT, I believe, is up to the end of, I think, 2021, I believe was the data cutoff. Again, could be, could be wrong on that, but I think it's around there. So I think we're probably just going to see a much expanded remit of what it can discuss. The really interesting question is whether it's going to have any kind of like reasoning modules or if it's going to be able to do things like multiplication, right? Which is something it really mm -hmm. struggles with at the moment. Um, whether that it's going to basically move beyond just incredibly good autocomplete and actually introduce some more kind of reasoning style uh, capabilities. Move closer towards sentience. Right. Mm, appearance of sentience. <laughs> yeah, <least>. appearance of sentience. <laughs> well, I mean, th this thing, th the idea of running out of training data is so fascinating because like you said, um, you know, is that at the point, like it hasn't like broken through to the mainstream yet, although there's loads of debate around synthetic data. So if you start training models with synthetic data, would they somehow, would that synthetic data be limited? Because it's like, created at, at some point, you know, would it have like biases in it? Like, I have no idea. Mm. How do you even begin to quantify um, whether synthetic data is valuable as a resource to train these models? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. And I, I think, you know, um, the space is still fairly nascent, right? So it's, I think it's quite hard to really sort of forecast really far into the future how, how good it could get. I mean, we've seen the quality of, of certain outputs from things like stable diffusion, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and they are very good, especially compared to, let's say, uh, GANs or generative adversarial networks. We've seen an exponential increase in quality there. Um, and so, again, if we can continue to fine tune these models um, on bespoke data sets, maybe they can start creating outputs which are really, really compelling and convincing and provide clean data. The interesting question for me around this is, do we get the kind of problem that you almost have when you take like photos of photos of photos of yeah. photos and you keep, yeah. you keep losing information effectively mm -hmm. through the iterations of, you know, kind of recapturing that data, that information. Um, you'd have thought because it's synthesizing two pieces together or multiple forms, um, particularly in stability based models or diffusion based models, models, sorry. Um, that problem might be 
might not happen, but um, it, it's an interesting one to watch. I think we're going to see more and more companies creating synthetic data sets. Um, but if they can be the foundation for the next leap, once organic organic data disappears or is, or is used up, is a really interesting open question. And beyond like the debate about whether we need to use synthetic data, the, the final point I'd like to make, I guess, is based mm. on like my conversation with Ahmad from Stability AI, where he's kind of come out and said like the debate around AI art. So basically the debate about like endlessly scraping data and needing more uh, bigger and bigger training sets for these models. He says it misses the point, which is that the models of the future are increasingly going to be one shot in the sense that they don't need these huge data sets. They will only need a smaller training data set because I guess like all the masses of huge training data sets, which are on the models of the past have iterated to a point where you now have a new model where you just take um, data that's relevant, I don't know, to your company, to your organization, whatever the model is that you're trying to build, which I suppose would be generated in the context of whatever that model is bespoke and specific to, and that you would only need that. So to kind of uh, create the bespoke or specific outcome that you're looking for. So maybe rather than you need more and more data to train these models. We're looking at a future where you've kind of had the era of like the vast training. And now it's just that the models need to be synthesized with like bespoke pieces of data that are relevant to that output. Mm. I guess it's a bit like standing on the shoulders of data giants, right? <laughs> um, these models have got to where they are based on this large amount of data. But uh, as you said, maybe to optimize them for specific use cases, um, you don't need a huge amount of data to kind of fine tune them to specific applications. Um, exactly. Super interesting. Um, I, I'm sure it'd be great to talk to a mad again in a year's time and see see how things have changed and what he's thinking um, and what he's thinking on that front. Um, so. Yeah, um, what, what, what else did you um, pick up on this week, Nina? So um, I am gonna talk about deep fake neighbor wars. Have you seen mm. it? It's it's uh, the new ITV scripted drama, um, which is essentially basically, uh, it's like celebrities being cast as neighbors in Britain, having like neighborly squabbles. But of course, it's like all celebrities deep faked into having these like really banal uh, middle class neighborly struggles and strife. It's a new ITV show. I think um, some of the kind of the main artists who've been working in the deepfake satire space are behind it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's come out and interestingly, I think, uh, and you will be the one to, to ha know a little bit more about this because you've, I mean, you've written entire report on deepfake and satire. I don't mm. think they have like the consent of any of the celebrities who are featured as the squabbly neighbors to kind of <laughs> deepfake them into the show, but they have done so under the guise that, okay, this is clearly uh, a deep fake. This is clearly meant as satire. So, uh, what do you do? You think about deep fake neighbor wars? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I've done a lot of work looking at the kind of the politics of synthetic media and and kind of satirical uses and activism and things like this. Um, and we've you know we've talked about it again before on this on this show. Yeah. Um, you know, with the South Park creators and their Sassy Justice project. Um, and it's it it ticks all of the boxes for me of at least good faith satire right yeah um and that is it is clearly fake right it's in the title this is not trying to fool anyone it is inherently absurd like when you have uh the, you know england england football captain harry kane fighting with a grime rapper stormzy over breaking his pavement in his, in his, <laughs> or his patio or something um it's just ridiculous it's clearly not not real um and I think the other key thing is, yes, you mentioned consent, and that is really important. Um, but I think this is a kind of form of what we call punching up, right? So we're talking yeah. about well-known public figures, powerful figures in a lot of regards. Um, and the use case isn't, you know, putting lies in their mouth, which are defamatory. They're not commercializing their voice or likeness to sell products or anything like this. Um, it is in some respects, kind of the purest, one of the purest forms of satire you can, you can come up with. Um, but as Have you, you said, watched it? 
<laughs> I've watched some of the clips. I don't know if it's actually, I don't know if it's out aired yet. I think it might be out right. tonight. Um, but I'm going to watch it. I think it's going to be pretty good. Um, I'm really interested to see, Nina, as you correctly pointed out, um, Barney Francis, or who goes by Bill Posters. Um, he was the guy behind the Mark Zuckerberg Spectre deepfakes, which were part of an, a, an art campaign where Zuckerberg said, I'm stealing all of your data. And, um, you know, um, it was a very provocative campaign. Um, I'm really interested to see how his how his deep faking has improved over the years because I haven't seen a lot of his output since then. So he's the creator and the artist behind this project. And apart from the Zuckerberg, he also did Kim Kardashian, didn't he? Like way it, back it, in the day. Yeah. Exactly. So it was part of the same project of kind of um her talking about, I think, kind of manipulating her followers and social media likes and things like this, um, making her rich or something like that. Yeah. Regardless of whether or not you agree that this is fine because it's satire and it's obviously fake, if I was one of the personalities or the celebrities featured in the show, I'd be like on my agent be like, hey, why are they using my digital likeness without my consent? It's fine for mm. them to use it, but I want to be uh, maybe I'd, I'd demand some kind of payment or, you know, some kind of licensing of my of myself, my persona, even if it is for satire. It's a really good question. And I, and I think so. It's being published by the British broadcaster. I think it was ITV who are, who are broadcasting this. And I think who commissioned it. Um, they have said that they are doing, there is nothing illegal about what they're doing. So I imagine, as we know, you know, with the media, they have teams of lawyers around mm. this kind of content. I would imagine that even before this was started to be created, they've had IP lawyers and, and special counsel specifically on whether doing this is going to financially put them in trouble or is yeah. going to put them in trouble for defamation and things like this. Um, so I'd imagine that they have, they have kind of covered their, their backs, shall we say on this. Um, but I think the question about how, how you or I would feel if this happened, I mean, you've got some, you know, got a, a larger media presence than I do, Nina. Um, you know, <laughs> are you fair game for this kind of content now? Like, mm. could someone create a, a Henry and, and Nina conversation of us, you know, making ridiculous claims about AI, which was clearly fake? And how would we feel about that? Do well, they we could do that with of... Volley now. Three seconds. Yeah, well, they could. <laughs> they could. Um, exactly. But, do, you know, there's an interesting question here about the kind of, you know, we see, um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, and maybe we think he's fair game for being targeted with deepfake satire. Um, but where do you draw the line between someone who is maybe a private individual and then a semi-public person and then a public persona, right? Like, how do you... How do you decide who is fair game and who isn't? Some cases are really clear. Some are perhaps more controversial. Um, but I, I wonder as well um, if the creators notified um, the people featured mm -hmm. beforehand as a kind of a mark of, again, good faith and, you know, um, tried to get their blessing as much as is possible or not. It would be an interesting one to find out. Well, I guess like on the legal front and the IP and the copyright front, um, lawyers all around the world have a lot of work to do because there isn't precedent, right? It, it, and I'm supposing that when they did their due diligence and weighed up the risks versus the opportunities, ITV came, obviously came on the side of like, we're going to commission this because it's quite cutting edge. It's going to get um, lots of people talking. It's like quite a provocative and interesting new idea. But from the perspective of the celebrities who are being deep faked in the show. I mean, there's an opportunity here for them, not so much to be like litigate and take down. You've taken my persona without my consent, but it's more like this isn't the same as you putting on a wig and doing an impression of my voice. You're literally using AI to clone my likeness. This is something different. This is a, a further degree of intimacy, which is completely different from any kind of uh, satire or uh, satire of the past. So if you want to do that, fine. You may use my likeness, but you're going to have to pay me for it. It's a money-making opportunity, right? Yeah, I, I really agree with that. And that was something that came through in the in the research I did with MIT and witnesses that, you know, satire is as old as, you know, human communication. We've been taking the piss out of each other for, you know, for, for millennia, right? Um, there's nothing new, but you know, synthetic content, generative content, you know, as you said, that kind of visceral approximation of someone's likeness where it genuinely looks like them, right? Um, sounds like it you, sounds yeah. like them as well. Exactly. And um, we saw that with Jordan Peterson, the controversial um, 
public academic intellectual figure, um, you know, where he, his voice was cloned um, via a text to speech application. Um, and, you know, people were making it say really silly things. And then people were making it also say some pretty awful things, but under the kind of guise of it being a meme. And mm -hmm. he threatened to sue and it was taken down eventually. Um, and so I think there is a, a an unsettled legal debate, as you correctly point to, about, you know, is deep faking someone, is synthetically generating someone's likeness a new kind of satire, which should come with new kind of norms about how you use it, how you get permission, and also, again, how you commercialize it, right? Um, when South Park feature a famous actor as a kind of a cutout in their cartoon, you know, maybe that's very different to basically recreating their voice and face, you know, like for like. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see as this stuff becomes easier to make, how, you know, that legal landscape may shift. Uh, yeah, IP uh, lawyers, entertainment lawyers, copyright lawyers, lots yep. of work on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, we know, and we know some good ones in the space as well, you know, don't we? And people like uh, Matthew Ferraro, Matilda Pavis, um, you know, doing some really great work. Um, Kelsey Parrish as well on, on specifically this area. So check them out yeah. if you're interested in seeing what the uh, kind of landscape is like at the moment. So moving on, uh, what else have you picked up this week? Yeah, so I think this week we're, we're talking quite a lot about the sort of artistic, creative side of, of generative AI and deep faking and stuff like this, which I think is is a really interesting side. And it's where we're seeing probably some of the most interesting applications. Um, but there's one story that caught my eye, again, written by the same person who wrote the article about um, uh, data um, limitations, Chris Stoker Walker. Um, it was a really great spot from him, which was there was a big drama on Reddit this week where an artist who was commissioned to create um, a piece of art and spent 100 hours creating this piece of art, um, posted it to the subreddit rart, one of the biggest art subreddits mm -hmm. on, the, on the platform, um, and had this original piece of artwork immediately taken down and deleted by the mods of this channel because they claimed it was a stable diffusion piece of art or it was a mid-journey artwork, it was a generative artwork. Um, and when this artist reached out to the mods to say, hey, this is real, they again <laughs> said, no, it's not. And uh, I think banned them or again, just refused to to um, re-upload or reinstate the artwork. Um, the piece was kind of like a fantasy style, um, you know, and so I think- So popular that, on like- mid -journey very in particular. Similar to Mid-Journey, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So. The artwork, the composition, the subjects, you know, it was um, kind of like a, I can't remember exactly, it was like a, a like a warrior lady or something like this, kind of angelic sort of pose, um, you know, yeah. very similar to a lot of- journey. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, but it, to me, it's such an interesting story because it really, again, speaks to the challenge and in this kind of slightly I wouldn't say trivial to the artist, of course, they put in a lot of work and it'd be disheartening, of course, if your work was being dismissed in that way. But it's a slightly lower stakes example of the big problem that we're going to face with generative AI. And in some respects, we're already facing of discerning what is authentically um, kind of uh, manually created click by click, pen, voice, whatever, um, and what is synthetically generated. Um, and it's a great yeah. example of certain spaces just being fundamentally ill-equipped to make those calls. Um, I say before we, we, you know, we started recording, Nina, can you imagine if you, you wrote a, a dissertation and uh, you spent again, maybe tens, hundreds of hours writing that dissertation and, um, you know, schools are terrified of, of chat GPT star bots, um, you know, infiltrating their students work and, you know, people cheating and plagiarizing content, um, bought a piece of software that claimed it could spot you know, these pieces with a high degree of accuracy and it claims a false positive on your work, right? And says, well, no, this is that we, we've determined with a high degree of probability that this is synthetically generated content. You know, what is that going to do to that person? Yeah, that you, are, you are literally the 1% or the 3% where it, 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 you're like, your, your mod detector failed. And they're like, yeah, yeah, everybody says that. You know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. 
It'll be the new. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. It'll be the new my dog ate my homework, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but again, like I think it, it's the it's the challenge. Again, we've spoken about before on 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 this show is that you know um, detection systems at the moment, you know, when they reach kind of ninety eight, ninety nine percent accuracy. That sounds really good. And it is good compared to how some of the earlier models were working. But 1% of all essays, of all photos online, of all artworks, still a huge amount of content with potentially significant ramifications for the for the users or the writers or the creators of that content, right? If they're being tarred with trying to fake generative content is authentic content or the other way around when people can slide under the radar and get a one in a hundred chance and, hit, and yeah. hit it on the head. I mean, we've been talking about this problem for years because for both of us, this is actually like our entry point into the world of generative AI when uh, the kind of world of deep fakes first started merging and we were looking at it from the kind of risky perspective for the for disinformation, what it means for the health of the information ecosystem. And of course, we talked about it now in the context of essays or art, but this is a society-wide problem, right? Because mm -hmm. first of all, you're not going to have detectors for all forms of synthetic content. Second, even if you have detectors, they're not going to be 100% accurate. They're always going to have to be updated. So the cumulative effect of that is that the irony, of course, is that in order to inoculate the public, uh, to educate them, I hate that word, against some of the, the risks of um, synthetic content, as they become aware that anything can be created by AI, they're probably going to be more likely to be like, well, that's AI created, even if it's not. So you have to inoculate them. But as soon as people start to understand that anything can be created by AI, the medium of any media becomes fundamentally compromised. So uh, nothing has to be real unless you think it's real or anything can be faked by AI. So if you just, there is no way to quantitatively, quantitatively identify a piece of content of being like either authentic or synthetic, then um, all hell is going to break loose in society, isn't it? Yeah, we're, we're really caught between a, a rock and a hard place on this front, right? Exactly. We're stuck between this lies dividend, this plausible deniability for any piece of media to be potentially fake, regardless of whether that's kind of medium such as a video and audio, which up until now have been not sacred, but very hard to argue are fake when it comes particularly from, say, a private individual on their phone, as opposed to like a movie studio. Um, so we either have people just, you know, being incredibly skeptical about any media they consume, particularly if it's media that doesn't suit their worldview or um, is inconvenient. Um, or we have people trying to push detection systems, which are just not robust enough yeah. and will, you know, have no guarantees of remaining accurate and precise as the, uh, as the generative technologies evolve, um, being deployed in ways which could effectively, you know, cause more harm than good because they give people false confidence that something is real or fake. Um, and, and potentially do real harm to careers, lives, et cetera, you know, on that basis. Um, so this, this example of this artwork, right, obviously they're not, well, maybe they are using detection systems behind the scene. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't think so. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a clear example to me of, you know, in a seemingly kind of petty context, how in much more serious context, we're in a bit of a pickle to put it mildly when it comes to <laughs> a, a big pickle. Know, yeah. yeah. Especially again, these, these tools aren't going to get worse, right? Outputs aren't going to get less realistic as time goes on. Um, you know, sophistication of these tools is not going to drop. Um, you know, it's only going to get better. And that means and it's like, only going to get harder. And like we discussed last week, that just the sheer volume of like synthetically generated content, like the, the flood that's about to be unleashed, um, mm. is, um, and the, uh, we just don't have the tools in place to be able to either detect or to have like, we've been involved in lots of conversations with like the content authenticity initiative and other kind of pioneers are looking at it from the perspective of, okay, let's authenticate content instead of trying to detect everything that's fake. But mm -hmm. there isn't anywhere near kind of a widespread adoption of these kind of content authenticity initiatives and tools so that when the flood of 
AI generated content hits us very soon, we're going to be able to say, okay, we have like detection tools and authentication tools. So we can say with a pretty high degree of certainty in 99% of uh, cases, whether this is AI generated or not, we, we just mm. don't have that. Yeah, no, definitely not. And I, I think the content authenticity, the provenance based approach, right, as you said, um, sort of uh, securing what is real as opposed to spotting what is fake. Um, is a better approach, that more bottom-up approach to media authentication, I do think is a better approach. And it's still early days. And that initiative has made some real strides in terms of getting people like camera manufacturers on hold, involved, chip manufacturers, um, some of the big tech platforms, um, which is really promising. So I hope that we see that standard really take hold. Um, but I guess the concern, as you said, is, you know, will it be able to spread far enough and will it be able to reach the people that we really need it to reach and convince who are those who are more likely perhaps to fall for some of the more um crude forms of media manipulation we see now such as cheap fakes right um my hope is we see detection being used as um a part of a suite of tools right yeah. um with a human in the loop always um kind of overseeing that data and contextualizing it um my fear though is that given how we've seen things like automated content moderation on social media, when you're dealing with the volume of content that, you know, that now exists and is created on a daily basis, having a human in the loop in, in a meaningful sense is going to be very, very hard. Yeah. So you're probably just going to rely on your detectors, which you know are imperfect, right? I fear that might be the way things go, even if it shouldn't be. Until it gets very controversial and then you bring in your <laughs> human kind of content moderator. Uh, yeah, content. or you're wealthy enough um, to do it, right? Yeah. Um, or you're, you know, it, yeah. it's criminal, you know, things don't have to be criminal to still be harmful, I guess, in certain contexts. So, yeah, it's 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 a really tricky one, but I thought this artwork story was a, an interesting one. Do you one. know if the artist, I don't know if it's, um, if they, were they in any of the training data? So is it like a Greg Rutowski who became like the most famous or the most popular prompt in Stable Diffusion? He's a digital artist. Yeah. He's been quite prolific in and vocal about, um, you know, speaking about how this has been so pernicious from his perspective, how it, his artwork is basically being ripped off. So that kind of high fantasy style we've been mm, referring mm. to with Mid Journey, that's like very Greg Rutowski-esque. Do you know if that artist was actually in the, in the, the training data? That's a great question. I don't know. I don't, I want to say no, but I will double check the article. We need to start putting the articles in the, uh, in the bio, Nina, so people can yeah. read up on them. But, um, yeah, I don't think so, but it, it could be possible. I mean, the amount of artists work that are in these data sets is huge, right? So it could well be the case. Um, I mean, that would just be the ultimate irony, wouldn't it? If, if, it would if, he, be, yeah. if they were like in the training data and it was like literally their work, which was then dismissed as a fake because of, yeah. Yeah, no, that would be, that would be ironic to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, one more story here to, mm. to talk about, um, it's not something I know, uh, enormous amount about because I am not a biologist or a scientist, but it is just going away a little bit from the entertainment and content creation angle and the big tech angle um a lot of there's been a lot of interest and focus increasingly on how generative ai can also be applied into scientific discovery so a basically it's a it's a medical company called absky they are using generative AI and AI models to basically try and uncover new antibodies. And they managed to do so using E. coli, you know, that, that horrible, um, was it, what is it, a virus, a bacillus, a bacteria, <laughs> uh, a, a bug. Yeah. A horrible bug, which they have basically managed to create a model around to find a new antibody to help, uh, curate human resistance. So we've seen a couple of things in the AI space now in the generative AI space, famously also with DeepMind, with AlphaFold, where they've been using AI to predict new kind of protein folding structures. But the top line seems to be that generative AI and AI are now accelerating not only content creation, we can make new things like movies or memes or text, but we can actually 
uh, move forward the process of scientific discovery. Because if they hadn't been able to do this, in this case with E. coli, using a generative AI model, it would traditionally take something like five or six years to be able to uncover a single antibody. Mm. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to be careful as well, Nina, because I, I live in Cambridge and I have many friends in the uh, the bio the bio yeah, kind of pharma tech sphere. So if I if I misspeak, I will get I will get butchered by them. butchered. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I think it's 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 a really great reminder that this isn't just a technology that's going to help marketers, right? Like this is not just a kind of um, customer facing sort of thing for creating flashy PowerPoints or yeah, yeah, nice, nice high fantasy artworks. But it has like real potential to revolutionize, you know, medicine, the way that drugs are synthesized um, and discovered. Um, we know generative adversarial networks have also been used um, in, in drug discovery as well. And I know that, again, a few of my friends are actually working with that technology, with those networks in that way as well. Um, and again, there's no doubt that the new models particularly diffusion-based models and other models that are coming forward are going to have a have a even bigger impact probably based on their ability to produce more fine-tuned results than perhaps GANs. Um, so it's really, really exciting. It's an area that I hope that we see some more news about um, perhaps as, as um, you know, people start experimenting more with generative models, um, but it could potentially help speed up you know, new new drug discovery in a way that we haven't been able to do before, which I think is, yeah, really exciting. Um, just, I don't want the E. coli. I'll, I'll pass on that bit. <laughs> I don't think anyone, did. yeah, <laughs> me too. Um, yeah, just to, just to add on that point, I guess like maybe one of the first kind of like mass applications is going to be this kind of spammy content that we already talked about. Everyone's going to have like their own AI power chat bot. Um, mm. I was at a conversation recently where uh, somebody said, uh, actually it was a dinner at CES, where they were saying that eight, Facebook now uses AI to do like 50% of their marketing ads. So like you have this like incredibly high turnover a bit like spammy businessy markety seo type of like generative ai content but really exciting to read about all of these potential other fields of um scientific discovery when i when i spoke to mad he was also speaking about how it's applicable in the context of education so beyond kind of like that fast synthetic content, um, perhaps you and I should also look a little bit more into kind of the other areas, which m perhaps won't get as much interest or investment, but how this is unfolding in ways that are just really revolutionary in terms of um, moving, procuring real benefit for society. For sure. I think maybe in, in fairness, Nina, they probably get a lot of investment, but it's um, it's in different circles than perhaps some of the investment kind of uh, channels that we monitor more closely. That's um, true. So absolutely. I think we should we should really try and help, you know, our audience understand all of the different applications that, you know, AI and generative AI are, are helping to advance not just um yeah not just uh blog posts and uh weird <laughs> weird weird kind of like cat dragon pictures <laughs> okay finally uh um it's time for bullshit or breakthrough mm -hmm. so henry i really like the story about running out of training data so do mm. you think that 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 not, i'm kind of twisting the question here do you think that's a bullshit story or is that uh legitimately going to be a serious problem yeah. Okay. So I'll interpret that as like, yeah, should we be worried or shouldn't we about this? Mm -hmm. Um, or at least should companies developing it be worried? Mm -hmm. Um, I guess my, my kind of instant reflex is that chances are the models are going to get so good so quickly based on the new, you know, again, these fevered stories about GPT-4 that I wonder how much better new data, which isn't just uh, contextual current affairs style data about, you know, the state of the world as it is in a year as opposed to now, or perhaps updates for, again, scientific discovery and things like this. Um, I wonder how significantly that's going to impact the viability of these tools to do the kinds of things that people are excited about them doing, such as writing content, again, in the education space, as you mentioned. Um, so on that basis, I'm going to say, I think it's probably closer to bullshit in terms of the concern and the impact this will have than than a breakthrough. Um, 
maybe there's others out there who who think this is going to be a huge problem and this is going to completely paralyze this new industry and this new um kind of technology if so let me know but um i think chances are we're going to get to a level of quality where you know um we might run out of training data essentially but we don't really need much more as you said with Ahmad. it's more about domain speci uh, specificity that's the, how you yeah. say that word um than than it is about radically augmenting the capabilities of the models i agree with you actually on that um mm -hmm. so do you have one for me <laughs> yes i do i do um so i i think this drug discovery one is really interesting um again something that we perhaps haven't really touched on a lot um in these conversations so far um but it seems really interesting to me. And I wonder if you think that it's going to be kind of the future of drug discovery. And, you know, if you think this is going to make a real splash in, in how, you know, the pharmaceutical industries work, or if you think that this is maybe a bit of a gimmick. <laughs> I actually think it's a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm actually gonna go with breakthrough, even though um, it's a field that I need to look into uh, and understand a lot better, but just intuitively and using my fingerspitzgefühl to use that um, lovely German word, the idea that AI can now expedite these scientific discoveries um, is incredibly exciting. And I don't think it's hype. I think we're already starting to see some of these foundational models with like AlphaFold and DeepMind and, and, and this company. I mean, they, they've literally... Uh, in this in this the story we discussed today with Atsky, um, they literally did it with an antibody from E. coli. So I think we're going to start seeing many, many, many more of these stories and scientific discoveries. Right now, we're talking in the field of medical research and science, but I think just in terms of broadening our knowledge base and our understanding, generative models are going to play a seminal role. So we've talked a lot about how. Uh, generative models will play a seminal role in generating content and experiences, but I think there, it's also going to play a seminal role in discovery, uh, not only in science, but across the board for humanity. Yeah, I would agree. I feel it. I feel like asking on this one was maybe maybe a tad a tad unfair, given that as you said, we're not scientists uh, or, or biological scientists. But yeah, I, I think you're absolutely spot on. It seems, you know, the the potential is huge, and we're only just scratching the surface. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, keep a uh, an eye out on my walks around we'll Cambridge speak to a for, scientist. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. for, um, <laughs> for some scientists who are doing some cool stuff with this, because I know there's a lot of them working on it. In, um, You're in, in a saturated in scientist zone. I am. I am. So <laughs> I know, maybe, maybe we can find one to come, um, have a, 